So today I just want to do what we'll call a Celine flyover. Those of you that know me know I like the Reader's Digest versions. It's my favorite thing about God. He said that if all had been written about what Jesus did on earth, there would not be enough volumes to contain it. He picked the highlights. He picked what he knew we needed to know. And he gave us those. So we don't know too much about Jesus' first 30 years in, here on earth. We know that he was born to an earthly set of parents. His mother was Mary and his stepfather was Joseph. And he was raised by them and they were godly parents. They took him to the temple. They dedicated him as their custom required. And it was there that two prophets immediately identified who he was. These were two people that had lived day and night in the house of God because God had promised them that they would see their Redeemer before he took them home. And they held God at his word. And they didn't want to miss it. So they were at the temple. We find in Luke 2 that it says that Jesus grew and became strong and he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. And then we don't hear too much about him until we find his parents took him to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts. As you can see, he lived in a very godly family. They went, they did the things that God required. And there, he listened to the teachers and asked many questions. And he had many answers for them at the age of 12. Who's 12 in the house? You got a 12-year-old in here? A real 12-year-old. Not Act 12. Awesome, Alexis. <laughs> okay, David, 12, your age. Got it? Okay. We see even at this young age that he knew who he was and who his real father was. He does manifest his humanity and he appeared, not to me anyway, to actually express a little bit of teenage attitude when his parents came back to find him and said, where have you been? And he's like, what? Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? Why were you looking for me? Hmm. Then we don't hear anything more. <laughs> his mother took over, yes, I know. Anyway. <laughs> a good mother. Anyway, um, we see that his earthly father was a carpenter, and we, it's supposed that he grew up doing the family business and building furniture and cabinets and working wood at that time. But he enters public life at the age of 30, when his cousin, John the Baptist, is bringing the message of hope and a new way of life with God through repentance and forgiveness of sins pointing to their foretold Messiah, their Savior, the one that they had heard of for years and years and years by their forefathers. Jesus came to John as he was baptizing at the Jordan River and he humbled himself and did what every other man was asked to do. And he was baptized. At that act of obedience, as I said earlier, the heavens opened and the voice of God boomed out from the heavens and declared that this was his son in whom he was well pleased. And he publicly pronounced him as his son. It's quite the baptism. But it seems to me I hear that quite frequently at baptism here where a voice from heaven comes and gives you your identity. After his baptism and his public identification, we find that Jesus went off to the wilderness for 40 days. And at that time, Satan came and tempted him. And he fasted and prayed during that time. He overcame the devil there. And when he returned, he began calling for disciples who would follow him and learn what God had for the future of mankind. 
There were 12 men that were hand-selected to travel with him everywhere, along with other men and women from every town that they visited. They sat at his feet to hear what he had to say. At times, multitudes would gather and listen and have their hearts opened to what he was saying about a new way to live, how to treat their families, their neighbors, how to have faith in the Almighty God. And everywhere Jesus went, he brought truth. He brought healing. He brought deliverance, wholeness, and life. They emulated a whole new way of living, and they demonstrated the law of love. It's amazing to me how much opposition that law of love incurs, even to this day. We find Jesus to be a man in every sense of the word, a human just like us who had a natural family. He walked, he ate, he cooked, it's my favorite. He dined, it doesn't say he shopped, but that's okay. He probably did. Anyway, uh, he ate, but he laughed and he cried with others. We find him full of emotions and compassion. He talked with people who were not accepted. He held children. He brought value to those who were generally overlooked. He cried. He cried over Jerusalem because they were his people and they didn't know who he was. He cried because they wouldn't accept that he was their gift from their heavenly father. He cried over Lazarus. It was his friend. He died. But I don't think he was crying because he died. He was crying because the family whom he loved and had spent much time with was hurt and angry with him for not being there when he should have been. They didn't really believe he could do anything about the situation now. It was over. Lazarus was dead. We go on and we find Jesus indignant. Can you imagine that? Loving Jesus. Indignant with religious people and their distorted teachings. He overturned their tables in the temple, exposing their selfish motives for prospering off the sacrifices that were meant for God alone. And he questioned their supposed piety by strict adherence to the law, but their inability to follow the greatest commandments of loving the Lord with all their heart and loving their neighbors as themselves. This caused the religious to continuously verbally assault his identity. They always kept saying, he is not the king of the Jews. He is not the Messiah. They assaulted his purpose on earth, and they questioned all his motives. They would find fault if he healed someone. It was either not the right day to do that on. I guess there's special days that you can only get healed on. You'll notice that they didn't say God couldn't heal, but there were special days. Um, maybe he shouldn't have done that because there's sin in the family. It pretty much didn't matter. No matter what he did, it wasn't right or good enough. It didn't matter that he never harmed anyone, that he only healed them. If he forgave them, he was, uh, rather than punishing them, he was considered a friend of sinners. I don't think they meant that nicely, by the way. The list goes on and on. But I think we all agree that Jesus was very misunderstood, and we certainly see that human rationale does not work in God's world. Fast forwarding the next three years, during this time, Jesus taught his 12 disciples everything his father asked him to teach them on how to live out one thing, love. He warned them of the things to come he even told them of his horrific ending on earth. Yet he always pointed them to the purpose of his coming, and that was to redeem mankind. He lived a life of surrender, understanding his father had a plan, a good plan, that would restore mankind to be able to choose to have a personal relationship with him and to become his sons and daughters. A plan that would bring man back to the place of walking and talking with him once again, 
with their creator, understanding his great love, God's unacceptance of broken fellowship with his creation. God would not accept that. And he came up with a solution for you and I. This brings us to his final week. <laughs> Here on earth, it was crazy, like I said earlier, starting off with dancing in the streets. He definitely was announced and celebrated. The one favored by God, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They all got it that day. It's amazing what seven days can do to someone. I kind of found it interesting, too, that he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. That was the way he rode in on, in his mother's womb when he entered the earth. Hmm. He had very humble beginnings and a very humble ending. The week that went on from that time when he entered Jerusalem included a time where he was having dinner with Simon the leper a man who was an outcast of society, could not be touched by people, had to live as an outcast, was healed, made whole, and Jesus was there at his house for dinner. Jesus was not above any earthly man. He'd come into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover with all the rest that were coming. He reminded his disciples of what he had taught them, what he expected of them. He then showed them one last true expression of royalty. He became a servant. And he washed their feet. He prepared them for the journey in spreading the gospel of his kingdom when he left. You know, next came the betrayal by one of his closest friends. I mean, you have to remember, Judas walked and talked with him for three years like all these other disciples. I think we find Jesus kissed him and called him friend. Once again, he proved that he was subject to others' mistakes, disapproval, jealousy, and wickedness. Then we find him praying in great despair and anguish, knowing what the next few days would bring. Separation from his father. He was assaulted and brought to stand before the highest governmental official ruling in the earth to be condemned to the most brutal death available at that time. During these final hours, he was deserted by all and crowds went into hiding. Association with Jesus now meant death. Jesus was left to take on all of mankind's sin. Every form of hatred, murder, idolatry, adultery, false accusation, all alone. At his death, we find his, only his mother, brothers, and a few friends at the cross watching this brutal end of his life. They watched him crowned as a king with thorns and lay his life down for all in front of them. It seems like kind of a really sad story, really, right there. Pretty hopeless. People that were following him were probably ripped up, torn up, didn't know what they thought, where things were at. So, but we read on. We go on to find the reactions after Jesus' act of love. I myself, I, when I read the Bible, I tend to look at people and how they respond. It intrigues me. I try to find myself in those stories. Sometimes it's not a good place I find myself. The people I relate to sometimes... But then I finish reading the book. And I'm always given hope that I, too, will become what God's called me to be. So I want to take a quick look 
This passage has come from John 20 and all the other Gospels. But we first find that after Jesus' crucifixion, that a secret follower of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, becomes emboldened and goes to Pilate. Now, mind you, he's been a secret follower up till now. And he goes to Pilate and asks for Jesus' body so he could bury it. He was willing to take someone whose physical body, who that body embodied Joseph's dreams, his hopes, his belief for the kingdom to come. He asked to take that dead body. And he cared for it, he anointed it, he wrapped it, and he laid him to rest in a tomb that he paid for himself. We find in John's account of the resurrection a few days later that the women went to the tomb to find it empty. They ran back to the others and told them what they saw. So they came running. I have to laugh a little bit when I was reading John 20. You know, I say I like to look at people. The book of John was written by John. The book of John was written by John. John was obviously self-confident. He refers to himself as the one whom he loved. And he also noted that he outran Peter to the tomb. Some of those things just make me laugh. Like I said, sometimes you find yourself in some of these stories. Not that I could outrun anybody, that's for sure. That definitely wasn't me. <laughs> but back on track, we find that when John and Peter went to that tomb and they saw John, Jesus was no longer there, they then remembered all the things that God had said, that, like he told them all these things. They got their memories back. It's awesome. And it says, then they went home. I, I thought that was interesting. OK, exciting news. They came, they saw, got the facts, and went back. OK, on the other hand, the women, God bless the women. They stayed at the entrance of the tomb, that place that held the end of their hopes and dreams, the place that held the one that had held the one they loved. And they mourned and they cried, and they were trying to figure out where did they put him. It wasn't until Jesus said Mary's name did their lights come on that they got it, that Jesus did everything he told them about. So I asked myself, who had the right reaction? The men who came, believed, and left? Or the ladies who stayed and grieved in unbelief and heard their name? Hmm. What I see in that story as that Jesus was most concerned about them having a personal relationship with him. He was willing to make sure that they knew without a shadow of a doubt that he was a personal God, not a statue, not a whatever all the other idols are that were in their culture, but that he was a personal God. He wasn't just a teacher with good ideas but he was a real compassionate God who understood the place of their heart. And he would not leave those women until they were certain of that. So Jesus didn't get all worked up over their emotions. He was okay with it. Guys, it's okay sometimes, okay? <laughs> but it, the story doesn't end there. We find Jesus goes on to where the other disciples were. He didn't wait for them to come find him. I did kind of find it interesting that there wasn't like this huge mob run to the tomb. 
These are just the facts. But you know, he didn't write them off for not believing what he had told them earlier. He came and he dispelled their unbelief. He allowed them to touch him, find out for themselves through experience that he never, ever gave up on them. He then spelled out what was next for them, letting them know that they had an important part to play, that he was only act one. <laughs> that God's redemptive plan was that he would be the first of many sons and daughters that would walk across the earth just like he did, and they would display and bring life to everything and everyone that would believe they just needed to follow him. We find that Jesus didn't even let Peter's failure of denying him in his darkest moment prohibit God's destined plan for Peter's life. Jesus challenged Peter to prove his genuine love to all mankind by living out the plan of building his church to feed the lambs and the sheep, the young and the old, and to tend for them. And last, we find Jesus challenged those ordinary men and women to wait till the Holy Spirit came to give them power to do what they were to do. And then he commissioned them to go and do what they were called to be, do. I want you to note, he told them first to wait and to find out who they were to be, and then he called them to do. There are many people who tell you that Christians are not human doings. They are human beings, and you must be. But in order to be, you must do. They go together. They work hand in hand. Jesus came for a purpose. He knew who he was, and he did what the Father asked him to do. That's what we're to do. So I ask you, where do you find yourself in the story? Or better yet, maybe your mind has wandered off to where someone else is in this story. <laughs> we never do that, right? Sometimes we tend to think it's over, but it's not. Some of you sitting here may be at the very beginning of just learning and discovering Jesus and answering his call to follow him. Learning about his plan and purpose for your life. Keep following him. Learn his ways, find your destiny. He has a specific plan and a purpose for you. Find out what it is. Some here might be like Joseph of Arimathea, whose desire is to see the kingdom come but who was still willing to take what he thought was dead, anoint it, tend to the body, and bury it. My question is, can you believe God can resurrect it? Because there's things sometimes in our lives that we declare dead. The question is, does God declare it dead? Or is there a purpose? It doesn't matter how bad it looks. The question still is, will you go after the promise of God? Will you keep pursuing him even though everything looks dead? Moving on to those that maybe have sat at his feet and embraced his promises and yet you find yourself like the women at the doorway of an empty tomb. Wondering how in the world is this going to come to pass? Wondering if your promises have died. It's just been too long. I just can't believe anymore. He's here. He's calling your name right now. He knows your name. He knows who you are. He's not going to leave you there. He's going to make sure you know who he is.
Some here may believe, have believed, and you're merrily on your way home. <laughs> and you're just kind of wondering what's going to happen next. God bless you. I've got an answer for you, too. <laughs> your time is here. No matter where you are in this story, your time is now. You've, been, you've received the Holy Spirit. You've been given the power to do what he's asked you to do. You've been discipled. You understand. You have his teachings. You've got your instructions to go into the world. Your community, your schools, your jobs. Some may even go in to our county, to our state, to our to the United States. Some may go into nations. Whatever God's called you to do, ask him where you are right now, what has he positioned you for? Because I'm here to tell you there are some of you who are being positioned and are beginning to walk into those places. Just like the disciples were positioned. They were waiting in the upper room, they received what they needed, and they went and they did. And some of you are at that stage where it's time to do what God's called you to. It's time to realize that we don't have a lot more time. Things are getting crazy. I don't know about the world you live in, but mine is crazy. But he needs us to go out and teach that everyone can live a life in the midst of it all where God rules supreme, where God rules righteously, where injustice is not allowed, and that sin has no power over us. And even death cannot defeat us. The message of life must go out. We're going to take communion today. I'm going to ask the elders to get it. Is it here, Peggy? Awesome. I'm going to ask the elders, go ahead and just get that and start serving it. Getting it ready. Most likely, we will all identify with each one of these people at some point in our life. In each human reaction, it all boiled down to the fact that things didn't go the way people thought they should go. Anybody ever been there? God didn't do it your way? <laughs> I unfortunately have been there more than once. <laughs> they all had to come to the conclusion <laughs> that God's way was different. It was higher than their ways. You may be a disciple closely following Christ right now. You might even be at the moment like some of the disciples were where you're faithless. But knowing others were too needs to tell you your story does not need to end there. Judas is the only one that let it end there. Hmm. Why did God do it this way? I find myself asking myself that. Go ahead. God says that he's so loved the world. It's a love you and I can't even imagine. It's a love so big that it doesn't make sense. But it says he so loved the world that he gave his only son that who would soever would believe in him 
would not perish but have life eternal. He goes on to say that he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. He did it so you and I can have abundant and eternal life. No matter what happens to this earthly flesh, my life goes on. This is not the end of the story. The awesome part is there's going to be a people who won't even taste death. Thessalonians, <laughs> Timothy, they talk about those who are alive and remain when he comes back. If that happens to be in this lifetime, that's going to be pretty awesome. I want to be one of those people. <laughs> it's alive and remaining when he comes back. We have to realize that his blood was never meant to be wasted to just a salvation experience. But it was shed for a new life. Next week we're going to have water baptism. It's an awesome thing. Because you physically identify with the death and burial of Christ. And then you rise to walk in newness of life, a whole new world, a whole new life. So as you guys are holding those elements in your hand. That cracker just resembles, or is supposed to remind us, of Jesus' body. It's a simple thing. It's not complex. Some people like to make it hard. Some people want it to be 150 different ways to God. God made it easy. He made it simple. One way. Can't get lost if you follow the way. The cup represents the blood that he shed. So I want you to hold that for a minute. And I want you to ask yourself, has it been done in vain? Am I going to take his grace in vain? Or am I going to really believe that he shed his blood for me and he gave his body and broke it for me so that I would never have to pay the penalty of sin? Confess if you're finding yourself struggling with unbelief. And just acknowledge that his ways are higher than yours. If you're in a moment right now where you have no idea what he's doing, just tell yourself it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He's got a plan. We too can overcome and be faithful and go out there and turn the world upside down like those original disciples. challenge remains. Will we pursue him? Will we pursue his presence? Will we never give up? Will we get up if we've fallen? And if you found yourself that you're running, are you ready to outrun him? There may be some of you who are like John, and you're just going to run harder. Whatever today means to you, take the challenge, because I'm pretty sure there's a little bit of everybody in that story here today.
So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your broken body. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much, that you came, you walked, you talked, you lived life to the fullest. You experienced every emotion, every pain, every joy of living in this life so that we too could do it with our Father. We thank you for this broken body.